the today's program. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, I welcome you all to this 38th RIS TIP uh, lecture forum uh, on behalf of Vigyan Prasar. The STIP uh, lecture forum, which is being organized uh, by a group of organizations, the collaborative efforts, and this Science, Technology, and Innovation Policy Forum has been set up you know, with the objective that uh, promoting the debate and discussion on various aspects of science, technology, and innovation policy. And it goes beyond, the forum goes beyond the disciplinary boundaries by taking into account of intersectionality of science and technology and innovation. So this is being organized every month and uh, to sensitize the public discourse on science, technology, and innovation policy, and also aims to bridge the gap between the science and the society for dissemination of scientific achievements, as well as promoting responsible research and innovations. So the collaborative organizations who are organizing this uh, public uh, lecture program every month are uh, Research and Information System for Developing Countries, RIS, Terry, indo French Center for Promotion of Advanced Research, Safipra, Vigyan Prasar, and India Habitat Center, Earlier, we used to have regularly, uh, these programs were conducted at India Habitat Center in the evening as public lecture, but uh, for last one and a half years, two years, we, are, we have gone virtual. So in today's lecture, we would be delving uh, into the journey of growth of solar physics in India, the Madras Observatory, and its well-established tradition of astronomical observation marks the origin of solar uh, physics in India in 1786. And later, uh, the British government took st uh, a step further and established the Kodai Canal Observatory in 1899. So however, at the, on the policy front, the, a committee appointed by the government of India, which was chaired by uh, Professor Meghnath Saha, the renowned physicist, recommended the improving of the facilities for solar observations in 1947 uh, in the country and rest is the history presently we have three main optical solar facilities. I know I'm addressing to the, uh, the August gathering of all uh, theoretical phys astrophysicists, uh, both practical and theoretical, and still for the uh, purpose benefits of other uh, 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 people, audience were present here. Uh, there are uh, presently, we have three main optical solar filters, which are located at uh, Kodai Canal Observatory, which is operated by Indian Institute of Astrophysics. Uh, then we have the Udaipur Solar Observatory, which is operated uh, by Physical Research Laboratory, and Aryabhata Institute of Observational Sciences, Aries in Nanital, which is being headed by Professor uh, today's uh, the keynote speaker. Uh, but how has the journey so far been? What was the contribution of Indian astronomers? And uh, what else needs to be done for supporting this ecosystem? So who would be better to learn from about this than from the professionals who have been working in this field uh, for long, for ages, and the people who also represent and glorify Indian solar physics on the world stage. Uh, friends, today's lecture, uh, we have with us two such renowned big names in solar physics in India, Professor Arnav Rai Choudhury, who is an astrophysicist and professor at Department of Physics, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. And uh, today he will, Professor Arnav Rai Choudhury will be chairing the session to today's program. And uh, the talk will be delivered by astrophysicist Professor Dipankar Banerjee, who is currently the director of Aryabhata Research Institute for Observational Sciences, Aries, Nainital. Dr. Banerjee's area of interest is the sun and the solar atmosphere. His work has enriched our understanding of the sun and its impact on space weather. Warm welcome to you, sir, to both of you. And to begin with, I request Dr. Nakul Parasha, director of Vigyan Prasad, to deliver the welcome address with whose motivation and leadership, leadership began Prasar, uh, we have been able to take forward the legacy of science communication across the country and also at the international platform. Uh, before I invite Dr. Parashar, I would like to remind the audience to mute their microphones for avoiding any disturbances during the session. And also I would like to encourage the audience to avail this golden opportunity to interact directly with the speakers, the well-known physicists, as well as uh, after the talk. And uh, you can directly ask questions on the Zoom platform, on this platform, online platform. And this program is also being teleca I mean, uh, live streamed on YouTube channel of Vigyan Prasar and ISTI portal. So the queries that we will be receiving at the, on these two 
platform will be taken up by our online moderators, Dr. Nidhu Srivastava and uh, Ms. Tusha Agarwal, and we will uh, pass on them to the speaker and the chairperson. And uh, thank you so much for being with us today. And we invite you uh, for your uh, live interaction. Uh, sir, Dr. Parashar, uh, I invite you for your welcome address. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kinkini. Uh, it's indeed a great pleasure, honor for me to uh, welcome uh, Professor uh, Arnab Roy Chaudhary and uh, Professor Deepanka Banerjee. Um, it, uh, I mean, it gives me uh, goosebumps when I, I feel that I'm here sharing the dais with you. It's always been, you know, uh, a dream to uh, be around with people who've been working so deep and have uh, such a long history and such a wide experience in the area of astrophysics. Something that uh, when I opted, uh, I had no other option but to go for material sciences as a part of my physics. But uh, always wanted, always looked at the stars and wondered if I could ever get deeper into it. Anyway, but it's always a pleasure to find, uh, you know, an opportunity to do this. And fortunately, Vigyan Prasar has been associated with RIS in organizing the STIP lectures. Uh, and I would uh, want to, you know, tell uh, uh, Professor Arnab and uh, Professor Deepankar about the STIP lecture series that has of uh, uh, this top uh, um, people in their uh, area domain that have delivered these lectures. And we feel very honored, privileged to have both of you with us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having accepted our invitation for this lecture. And I'm sure uh, there's a lot more that we could go on and on. And I'm, please forgive me. I've been a teacher at the College of Engineering, so I normally don't stop till my 40 minutes are over. But I, I'm sure I, I, have, I don't have that privilege here. So I would now request uh, Professor Arnav uh, to uh, take it over from here and uh, go ahead because all of us are anxiously waiting to listen to both of you and particularly Dr. Uh, Professor Deepankar Banerjee in this, uh, on this interesting topic that uh, we have chosen today. So thank you so much uh, on behalf of Vigyan Prasar, RIS and all other organizations that are working with us to organize this monthly lectures that have brought a lot of uh, information and a um, huge repository of knowledge that has gone in. Thank you so much. Jai Hind and Jai Bharat. Thank you, Professor Rajatri, Okay, uh, so thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Parashar and Dr. Mishra. So let me uh, share my slides. Uh, I have only a very few slides. Uh, so so you can see my slides. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so. So I am extremely happy that uh, Vigyan Prasar is uh, organizing this public lecture on solar physics in India uh, to be delivered by Professor Dipankar Banerjee. Uh, it is uh, my honor and privilege to chair this lecture. And I have been asked to make a few re pre preliminary remarks to set the stage for Dipankar. So let me begin with, uh, with the assertion that uh, solar physics is uh, one of the most thriving areas of astrophysics in present day India. Uh, to support this assertion, uh, let me just uh, uh, mention two facts. <clears throat> so this Astronomical Society of India started giving Modali Award three years ago for an astrophysicist younger than 45. And out of these three Modali awards which had been given so far, two went to solar physicists. And again, secondly, this International Astronomical Union also uh, three years ago started giving a PhD at large award for the best PhD thesis in astrophysics from any country in the world. But very, very remarkably, out of these three uh, PhD at large awards which have been so far given by Astronomical 
uh, International Astronomical Union to have come to India to Indian students who were who had done their PhD thesis on solar physics. So I think just these two facts uh, will, will will convince you of my assertion. And on a personal note, uh, this first winner of a Modali Award and the first winner of PhD at large award both uh, happen to be my former PhD students. So anyway, it is often said that uh, we study astrophysics only out of intellectual curiosity, and it has no connection with our everyday life. However, solar physics is one branch of astrophysics in which uh, deal with uh, phenomena like uh, solar flares, which do affect our everyday life, as uh, surely uh, Dipankar is going to explain in a few minutes. But in spite of that, uh, the general public do not know as much about solar physics as uh, cosmology or black holes. So perhaps we solar physicists are also at fault that we uh, do not uh, publicize our field uh, properly. So since Dipankar will mainly talk about uh, that, uh, what is happening in solar physics in India in the last few decades, to set the stage, uh, let me tell you a little bit about, the, about the, the historical growth of this field, both in the world and in India. So we often say that uh, modern astronomy began when uh, Galileo turned his telescope towards the sky. And one of the objects which Galileo studied was the sun. So he noticed that uh, sunspots, these dark spots on the surface of the sun, they keep changing their positions from day to day, from which he concluded that the sun is rotating about its axis. So this discovery of uh, solar rotation by Galileo can be taken as the beginning of solar physics. Then in the year 1844, Schwabe discovered that uh, sunspots have a 11 year sunspot cycle in other Words the number of uh, sunspots seen on the sun, that the number goes up and down in a cyclic fashion with an approximate cycle of 11 years. And then in 1859, Carrington became the first human being to observe an explosion on the sun, a solar flares. And how these things like sunspots, their cycle and flare, how these are produced, a definitive clue for that came in the year 1908, when Hell discovered that uh, sunspots are regions of very strong magnetic field, about 5,000 str times stronger than the magnetic field at the geomagnetic poles. So now we know that the 11-year sunspot cycle is the magnetic cycle of the sun, and this magnetic field plays the crucial role uh, in, in the formation of uh, sunspots and the uh, production of flares. And now the sun happens to be a body made of a plasma, uh, often called a fourth state of matter, a very hot gas in which atoms are broken into positively charged ions and negatively charged electrons. So to understand uh, various uh, 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 solar phenomena, we need to know how to handle the this, this, uh, this interaction of plasma with the magnetic field. So uh, this basics of the subject, magnetohydrodynamics, they were laid down in 1930s and 40s by such scientists at Alvin and Cowling. And after laying down of these foundations from 1950s, a really glorious uh, era of solar physics uh, began with uh, two landmark papers by Eugene Parker, so in 1955, he formulated what is called dynamo theory, which provides the explanation of how magnetic fields arise in astronomical systems. And then in 1958, he theoretically predicted that there will be a flow of plasma starting from the sun and flowing through the entire solar system, which he called solar wind. Till that time, it was thought that the space around the earth is, is, is completely empty. We now know that it's in, the earth is, a, uh, the solar system is embedded in the solar wind. And some uh, four or five years after the theoretical prediction, the solar wind was discovered from a space mission. 
And from 1970s, there have been regular space missions to dedicated for studying the sun, as uh, the Pankar will discuss. So after giving, telling us uh, how, uh, how this solar physics uh, developed in the internationally, till at least till the, uh, till the middle of 20th century. So let me say a few words about India. The first large modern astronomical observatory in India was, was a solar observatory, which was set up in Kodai Canal. And then in the first decades of uh, first few years of 20th century, some important developments took place. In 1909, Evashed, who was a director of the Kodai Canal Observatory, uh, from there discovered a kind of flow pattern around sunspots, which is called Evashed effect. And then in 1920, Meghna Shah formulated the theory of thermal ionization by applying it to the sun. So the first paper of his on this subject was uh, 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 titled Ionization in the Solar Chromosphere. But after this glorious beginning, for several reasons, there was a lull in solar physics research in India for several decades. And then it got revived only in the 1970s and 80s uh, due to uh, some uh, scientific leaders like Bhatnagar, Chitre, Hassan, uh, Venkatakrishnan, Divedi, and many others. So, uh, so Dipankar will be talking about this era. So let me just mention that uh, some of these pioneers in, in solar physics in India had also been interested uh, in, in, in science outreach. So I still remember a fantastic public lecture on the sun given by Professor Arvind Bhatnagar shortly before his uh, untimely death. And then uh, Professor Divedi wrote a superb article on solar corona uh, which appeared in uh, Scientific American and was in fact selected as a cover article of Scientific American, a very rare honor. And I also have tried to do my little bit that I wrote a popular science book, Nature's Heart Cycle, A Story of Science Sports, published by Oxford University Press. And if you don't want to read the whole book, but want to have a summary of that, then you can listen to my lecture, which is available on YouTube here. So this was the very prestigious TIFR Science Day lecture, which I was invited to give. So before leaving, giving the floor to the Ponkar, so let me just end by raising one provocative question, which the Ponkar may address that in the last few decades, there has been an explosive growth of solar physics in India. But still, is that enough? So we often like to compare India with China. So uh, since I know about the uh, solar physics in China quite well, so let me make a few remarks about that. So India was definitely ahead of China in solar physics when I was requested to supervise a Chinese student, Ji Jiang, in 2006. Uh, so during a brainstorming session of Chinese Academy of Sciences, it was uh, 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 concluded that uh, that China has has has, has uh, uh, it was uh, it was uh, noted that China has no expertise in solar dynamo theory, and it was uh, desirable that a young Chinese student should uh, should should get into this field. So that from the Chinese Academy, I received this invitation uh, to come as a visiting professor uh, to Beijing for a few months. Then uh, Ji also had came to India a couple of times. And in fact, uh, she had the benefit of attending uh, a, a, a superb uh, uh, solar physics school organized by Dipankar Banerjee in the Kodai Kanal Observatory. So here you can, uh, you, you can uh, see me standing in front of the historical telescope of Kodai Canal Observatory. This is G and my other student, Piali Chatterjee. And three of us uh, developed uh, theoretical formalism uh, to predict uh, the, the, the strength of a, a solar sunspot cycle before its advent. So we felt honored that our paper was selected as, as, as editor's uh, choice uh, selection in physical review letters as indicated by this site, which is a great honor for a physics paper. 
but more importantly, after four or five years later, when the solar cycle reached its peak, its strength was found to be exactly as what we predicted. So in the history of our field, uh, this is the first time it was possible to predict the strength of a solar cycle successfully before its onset. And coming to the question, is India still ahead of China in solar physics? My answer is uh, probably not, although we have China is marching ahead very fast. So do we have made quite a lot of progress? We need to do more as Dipankar will surely point out. So now coming to Professor Dipankar Banerjee, his early education was in Kolkata, BSc from St. Xavier's College and MSc from Calcutta University. Then he came to do PhD from Indian Institute of Astrophysics under the supervision of Professor Siraj Hassan. And in fact, uh, he also interacted with me when, especially when Professor Hassan was away for a sabbatical leave and the first paper of his life was uh, written with me. And then he went for postdoctoral work uh, to Arma Observatory in Ireland and Leuven University in Belgium. And then he, uh, in 2004, he again joined the faculty of Indian Institute of Astrophysics. And then 2019, he became the director of ADIS. And he's an elected fellow of Indian Academy of Sciences and National Academy of Sciences in India. And I would say that he's a very versatile solar physicist who has worked in the theory, data analysis, instrumentation. So one can hardly find another person in India more qualified to talk about uh, solar physics in India. So Dipankar, the floor is over to you. And uh, let me try to uh, stop sharing the screen. Yeah. Let me start sharing it and ensure that uh, all of you are able to see my screen. <coughs> Is yes, my sir. screen? Yeah. yeah, yeah yes, 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 yes. yes. Thank you very much. Uh, first to Vigyan Prasad, Dr. Uh, Kinkini and Dr. Nukul for giving me this opportunity. And thank you to uh, Arnuda. We fondly tell, uh, you know, refer him as Arnuda. Um, I must say, you know, uh, this kind of platform is used for uh, motivating uh, youngsters. And I have to agree that uh, I, my journey into solar physics was motivated by uh, Professor Raichuri Arnavda's lecture in industrial science. And I'm really, uh, you know, privileged today to be introduced by him. And I also noticed that uh, there are quite a few senior members uh, from the solar physics. Uh, uh, Professor Antia is online, Professor Anantha Krishnan is there. It's a real real honor for me to uh, speak in, in front of them, though virtually. Uh, so let me <laughs> start uh, my journey. Uh, so what I propose today is I probably will not be able to do a full justice of uh, describing what all things happened over several decades. Uh, I will try to connect some of the you know, older observations and where we are heading for because I see that in the current uh, epoch, we are really uh, heading into a probably golden era of solar physics, at, at least in the observational sciences. And I will also mention that today, I'm going to probably focus primarily on the observational sciences and the prospects what we have and connect with, with the, you know, a uh, bit of history, but uh, I, I have to uh, be a sort of excuse that I will not be able to do a proper justice of really uh, be able to cover the really history of solar physics in India. Uh, in half an hour, that will not be a right thing to do. So I, I decided that I will sort of only connect. Uh, and why do we need, first of all, to study the sun? That also has to be uh, you know, uh, briefly mentioned here. So here I am. Uh, I'm actually situated uh, at the Nainital. And I'm going to talk, uh, actually delivering this lecture from this building right now. Uh, this is called uh, Arya Bhatta Research Institute of Observational Sciences. Uh, this is our uh, older campus at Manora Peak, but uh, we have a new campus which uh, proudly hosts the largest optical and infrared telescope from this part of the globe, uh, namely the Devastal Optical Telescope, which you see here. Uh, I will not be talking about uh, these uh, facilities, maybe some other uh, opportunity. I'll be focusing on, the, on our nearest star, the sun. I'm currently at ADIS, but I'm still, uh, you know, uh, 
a proud member of uh, Indian Institute of Astrophysics, and I also affiliated member of uh, Center for Space Sciences in Iser, Kolkata. Very briefly, the solar facilities, uh, historically it has been mentioned in the introduction uh, session by Dr. Uh, Kinkini, uh, we have a, a H-alpha telescope at Nainital, which looks at solar flares primarily. These are explosive uh, you know, phenomena happening in the solar atmosphere, which affects uh, our interplanetary uh, space and eventually it also as, uh, you know, affects our near Earth environment as well. More recently, Udaipur Solar Observatory has been expanded with a new facility. This is a beautiful uh, you know, uh, observatory on the, on the lake. Uh, I will show you one or two more figures. Kodai Canal Solar Observatory is one of the oldest uh, observatories in this country. And Dr. Kintini has mentioned its uh, legacy as well. I will connect that as well. There are also few solar radio facilities. And I will come back to this uh, particular aspect that the modern day astronomy demands uh, you know, multi-wavelength. And what are the advantages of doing multi-wavelength that I will also uh, describe. And in that context, solar physics is actually paving a good way. Uh, this is a, a fantastic uh, you know, uh, radio facility. Of course, this is not dedicated for solar observations, but for primarily for distant objects. But it does have a you know, solar mode of observation uh, possible as well. We have near Bangalore a, a radio heliograph, which is uh, operated by New Institute of Astrophysics again, which uh, again looks at the radio wavelength uh, to study the sun. And of course, good old UT radio telescope is also there, which is operated by TIFR and NCRA, uh, uh, which also looks at the sun. So these are, you know, existing solar facilities uh, from the ground. And as I mentioned already, the Kodai Canal Solar Observatory of the Indian Institute of Astrophysics is located in the beautiful Palani range of hills in Southern India. It was established in 1899 as a solar physics observatory and all the activities of the Madras Observatory were shifted to the Kodai Canal. Dr. Kinkini mentioned about it. And this is the you know, oldest uh, you know, uh, uh, observing facility. Still, there is a, you know, a small little telescope here, which looks at the sun and every day takes one image from the oldest telescope, uh, probably this part of the globe. It also has one of the oldest library. It has more modern facilities in terms of a you know, twin uh, telescope, which looks at the sun with two different uh, wavelengths. It has this uh, uh, solar tunnel tower. You could see this is actually showing a, you know, a lot of these domes because underneath there is a tunnel. The sun uh, light is, uh, you know, ducted through this uh, telescope dome into the tunnel and uh, it does a lot of spectroscopy and so on. More recently, there has been a, a new telescope, uh, H-alpha telescope, looking at the flares and dynamic activities on the solar atmosphere. And there are also other facilities where you can, you know, direct the sunlight through a combination of mirrors into a room and then, uh, you know, more sophisticated, uh, you know, optical experiments can be done uh, in this kind of facility. So Kodaikanal Observatory, although this is a, you know, a very old observatory, it uh, continues its older operations and also it has, a, you know, uh, have modernized with a certain modest observational facility. It's not the cutting edge. We are aiming for the, you know, best next generation telescope. I will talk about it, but it still, still continues to do some uh, observations of the sun on a daily basis uh, from Kodaikanal. Uh, this is more of a modern uh, uh, solar observatory, probably the, uh, now the largest uh, solar facility from the ground base at Udaipur in this beautiful lake. Uh, there is a multi-application solar telescope. It is a half a meter you know, a telescope, uh, which has a, a good uh, you know, uh, feasibilities of measuring the magnetic field on the sun. As uh, Professor Raichudri mentioned that we know that the sun is our nearest star, and it is a dynamic star, it changes at different time scales. And now we understand that all the time scale variations, what we see is primarily because of the variation of the, its uh, magnetic fields presence or absence. And this is how we, uh, you know, different, you know, measurements of the magnetic field with the highest possible resolutions and accuracies are the, uh, you know, are the demand of the, uh, of the hour. So uh, most of the ground-based facilities are dedicated for these kind of uh, you know, uh, magnetic field measurements. I will not get into uh, technical details, but if some people have uh, you know, questions later on, we can try to address. Essentially, we are looking at uh, sophisticated magnetic field measurements through its uh, polarization properties or, or you know, magnetic other properties. Now let me get into 
uh, briefly, why do we need to uh, you know, study the sun? Sun is our nearest star. It's a normal star. It's a middle-aged uh, you know, star. We call it main sequence of spectral type. Do not have to worry about uh, really this jargon, but you can just uh, uh, think about any star is born from interstellar medium, then it undergoes its evolution, like our life cycle, uh, like uh, probably I have just, I'm crossing the, my middle age. Uh, so sun is still in this uh, middle age and it will go old and eventually it will have uh, its own death. But we don't have to worry about these time scales are of millions of years and we are uh, happily sitting in its middle age. Sun is a special star because it is the only star on which we can resolve the spatial scales on which the fundamental processes takes place. This is actually a very important statement because majority of the object in the sky, what we study them or what we observe them is as a point object. We really cannot see such details on the surface of that particular object. Whereas sun uh, being close to us, we with the, with the advent of the modern telescope from ground and space, we are able to see much more details and that particular details we extrapolate to other astrophysical objects. Of course, sun is a special star because it provides almost all the energy to the earth. Our existence is because of the sun at an appropriate distance. So we should be you know, worried about, uh, we may do a Shurya Namaskar in the morning or not, but we have to realize that our, our existence is because of the, you know, of the presence of the, this nearest star sun at an appropriate distance away from us. From a physics point of view, it is also a special star because it provides us with a unique laboratory in which to learn various branches of physics. Professor Rajudri mentioned in his uh, opening remarks that we have this fourth state of matter, primarily the plasma of physics. In the universe, actually 99.9% of the universe is actually in the plasma state. So if you really want to study the, uh, the properties of uh, matter, in the different astrophysical scenario, you need to take uh, you know, uh, plasma physics uh, domain and sun provides us with a unique laboratory because some of these experiments actually we cannot conduct in the terrestrial environment. So that's the limitation of a you know, terrestrial laboratory as well. As I mentioned briefly, the sun varies with time, sun's behavior varies with time and primarily we understand that uh, the sun, like all stars, is a very dynamic star, always active, always changing. And more we learn about our own star, the sun, we will be able to understand the other astrophysical objects much better. So that's the you know, uh, point. And for the physics students, you name any branch of physics, whether it is atomic physics, particle physics, nuclear physics, uh, spectroscopy, you know, uh, plasma physics, we have an application in the sun. So that is why, you know, me, I, I came from a physics background and I didn't have any knowledge, uh, you know, about any astronomy when I came for my PhD and I chose solar physics because I, I felt that my classical physics background will be probably more suitable for the study of the sun. Here, I show a actually movie of the solar atmosphere. This is taken from a, a NASA satellite called Solar Dynamic Observatory. It is looking at... Uh, uh, the outer atmosphere of the sun, namely the lower corona. And what you see here, there are the certain regions in the sun which are bright. And uh, in that, those regions, we also see there are certain kind of structures. These are called uh, loop-like structures, where we understand now all these structures are governed by the presence of the magnetic field. They are actually all associated, these regions are all associated with a sunspot. And as Professor Raichudri men mentioned, sunspots are the dark regions on the visible surface of the sun. Historically, Galileo started saying that. I will show you that. And then uh, these uh, regions are called active region. And you could see how active it can be. The amount of material which is exploding out of this uh, you know, region is going to travel through the interplanetary space and may head towards us as well. And it can interact with our satellite. It can interact with the people who are walking in the space or it can interact with us as well. But fortunately, Earth has its own magnetic field and it provides a shield for these kind of material and the energetic particles and magnetic uh, particles and all that which are coming uh, to reach us. So if Earth would not have its own magnetic field, we would have been great danger. Probably our existence would not have even happened. So here you see that these are called the uh, you know, active regions and the other regions where are 
you know that kind of dynamics you are not able to see from small ab observations they are in in the past they have been named as quiet region but i will show you that there is nothing quiet actually in the sun sun undergoes all kinds of you know temporal changes in different parts the scales of the changes could be different but they are dynamic all the time so there are variability in terms of seconds minutes hours days months years and millennia so we need to really understand uh, these variability uh, in a much more greater detail and with probably different you know uh, scales of uh, applications in the physics as well this is what professor rajchandra mentioned in his first thing galileo actually probably gave this first thing of uh, modern astronomy and along with the solar physics uh, development as well so this is actually animation showing galileo's hand drawn you know locations of the sunspots so he identified them of course he didn't know at this point uh, that the sunspots are probably strong sensitive at magnetic identified them and then he noticed that in subsequent days these uh, you know objects are actually moving towards the right hmm? so this is a, again an animation in a slightly uh, a bigger uh, scale so galileo uh, noticed already that the sunspots move across the solar disk in accordance with the rotation of a round body so it can only happen if some object is rotating around its own axis so this is again uh, you can see that more than 400 years uh, back you know what kind of uh, you know inputs we already had um, now today if you look at some day uh, in the uh, towards the sun it may look very boring because it doesn't have any any uh, special features but some days you will find there are these objects these are sunspots and of course uh, these are concentrated magnetic field regions we understand if you look a uh, very uh, little bit of close then you could see that a sunspot size of the sunspot is actually compared with the size of the earth so you can imagine how big these structures are how much energy and magnetic field they are uh, they are confining and if these uh, energies are expelled from these uh, closed uh, you know regions how much uh, you know disturbances it can cause into the interplanetary space so sunspots are actually magnetic structures they emerge from beneath the surface what we see on the sky on a uh, you know white light image means in our eyes also are uh, sensitive to all uh, visible wavelengths and if we look at uh, you know a, a standard uh, older days uh, film uh, uh, from from the sun these are all called white light images because they are composed of all these different optical wavelengths you will notice that the sunspots are like this but uh, now we understand from our theoretical understanding and so on that these sunspots are probably connected by these magnetic field lines they are called magnetic loops huh? and these magnetic loops are confining lots of plasma but these uh, sunspots are actually generated because these magnetic tubes are actually submerged from the beneath the surface so here you see i have gone underneath the surface of the sun these are like magnetic tubes you can compare with this you know rubber tube if you take a rubber tube and submerge it in a bucket of water you notice that this uh, rubber tube being slightly lighter than the water it will try to you know float and then when it comes out uh, of this uh, surface when it penetrates the surface it pair, uh, forms a pairs of sunspots so this is also again a very important uh, aspect that sunspots always comes in pair uh, one will be one polarity the other will be the opposite polarity so that is also a very important uh, you know property of the magnetic field so now these sunspot pairs they come and they uh, sorry i have to go back to the previous slide um, they are coming from underneath uh, and then when they come out they will form a, a, a magnetic uh, loop kind of structure in the outside uh, and we see them lying there for a few days or 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 uh, several days but then because of this some twist and so on these uh, tubes can get you know twisted and then eventually that can get ejected as a storm so these are called the solar storms and this process what professor rajudri mentioned uh, is also called solar flares and when such a flare happened you saw a bulk of material was thrown into the interplanetary space and then they will travel through this uh, space in the form of a magnetic uh, you know cloud and so on so that's actually a, a shorter time scale behavior of a sunspot how it is formed and how it uh, emerges out of the surface and then can lead to a a flare or a coronal mass ejection 
when such a huge amount of mass is ejected or thrown into the corona, these features are called coronal mass ejections and they travel into the intermediary space. Now, I will actually step back a little bit and I will now take you to a little bit of long-term study of the sun. In this plot, what I show is the yearly sunspot number for the last 400 years. Some days there are sunspots, some days there are no sunspots. There could be a period over which months or a half a year, you may not find any sunspot. But in certain period, we'll find many sunspots in a day as well. So this alteration of solar activity, uh, which is measured by the yearly sunspot number, is showing a kind of a sinusoidal variation with typically a 11 year of periodicity. And this is what is called the solar cycle. But if you notice, this solar cycle, these are called the amplitude of the cycle, is actually varying. And sometimes even the duration of these uh, you know, solar cycle can also vary between you know, plus minus one year. Incidentally, this is the vertical two lines, which, was, which is marked here. This was the period over which Samuel Swabe uh, first systematically observed or recorded the sunspot number. And he discovered that there is a sinusoidal variation of sunspot number. And that's why the solar cycle is often mentioned, named as Samuel Swabe as well. Where does we come now to India? From Kodaikanal Observatory, as it was already pointed out, which was established in 1999, from the beginning of the last century, regular observations of the sun exist. And not only from one particular of, uh, you know, wavelength, which is, as I mentioned, white light, you can also have different other filters. These are ionized uh, you know, elements of uh, you know, uh, a calcium, and uh, here it's a hydrogen. And what it allows you to probe different atmospheric layers of the sun. Sun also has its own atmosphere like Earth is had. There are some certain actually quite interesting aspects in the solar atmosphere is that solar atmosphere is actually hotter than the surface, which is quite unusual. I will, if I get time, I will briefly mention why it is so. But observationally, we know that corona, which is the outermost uh, uh, layer of the solar atmosphere is much, much hotter than the surface, which is about 6,000 degree and the uh, corona is at, at, at million degree Kelvin. So it is important to study different layers of the sun. This has been you know, uh, realized more than 100 years back. And this is uh, the one day, if I just go back into the archive, which is now, you know, I was just mentioning from Kodekina last 100 years, whatever observations have been taken, we have digitized all that data and put it in this archive. And then we can do a really high quality science in this. We have calcium line spectroheliogram from all this period. We have white light data. We have H alpha data, and we have some other, uh, you know, prominent objects which are like a floating cloud in the atmosphere for all these periods. Why I'm mentioning this again? This is a, it's a fantastic resource, and this is also showing this concept of multi-wavelength astronomy existed more than hundred years back. And you can imagine when I'm talking about growth of solar physics in India, if you took, take back an observational aspect as well, at least you know you can see what kind of resource Kodai Canal does provide today. And uh, you know some of my uh, graduate students have worked. This is a, a you know new uh, you know sunspot area uh, cycle. The, you could see the solar cycle, how you know, precisely we are able to reproduce for more than 100 years. There is another property which is uh, related to the solar cycle, which is shown in the lower panel. This is called the butterfly diagram because sunspots do not appear actually at, at fixed latitude. And depending on the phases of the solar cycle, that means you know, the beginning of the solar cycle, they will appear at higher latitude. And then with the progress of the solar cycle, they tend to move to the lower latitude. So these are properties which has to be explained by you know, theoretical models. And that is what exactly Professor Raichudi and his students uh, have been doing for last uh, you know, uh, several decades. And we have made substantial progress in this. But again, I will not get into too much into that details, but I wanted to just again highlight that in the growth of solar astronomy, at least to the observational sciences, Kodekinal Observatory has really, really contributed enormously. And we are only taking that legacy forward uh, for the, with the modern facilities. This is a slide which shows four images of the sun taken from different wavelengths. 
earlier days, of course, you know, from the ground base, you can only, uh, you know, measure primarily the optical wavelength. If you go to higher altitude, uh, like in, uh, in Ladakh region, or to some extent, even in, in our uh, location here at Devastal, you will be able to see some amount of infrared as well. And infrared uh, will probe, allow you to probe a little higher atmosphere, namely the chromospheric heights of the, of the sun. But if you really want to go even higher, uh, you know, atmosphere of the sun, you have to go to the space. So these are the, you know, images taken from two different uh, space observatories of uh, NASA. And you see uh, many more structures and features, and you can study their dynamics uh, much more detail. But my point is that today, for modern day uh, uh, solar physics, it is very important that we look at this in a comprehensive way. We just can't look at the only the satellite data. We will miss the lower atmosphere. And if we just look at the ground-based data, we will only see the solar atmosphere in the lower heights, not the upper heights. Because now we understand the entire atmosphere is very much coupled. All these changes, whatever is happening, either in lower atmosphere or in the upper atmosphere, they actually are responsible for these all these dynamic events like flares or CMEs, which is happening in the sun. So it is important that we move into the multivalent uh, uh, era. Uh, here again, I'm showing some uh, uh, examples of multivalent observations of active regions. As I mentioned earlier, these are the sunspots if you see in the white light. And if you see them in, uh, in coronal heights, you will see how these sunspots are connected by magnetic loop system and how these loop systems also evolve with time, with this uh, movie runs between few days. And these are chromospheric heights. They look slightly different. Corona, they look much more extended loop structures. And in the, of course, in the photosphere, you only see the, you know, the foot points of these huge magnetic tubes. So that's a scenario which can be only, uh, you know, obtained if you have multi wavelength observation. So that's the active region. I'm again showing you one example of my again uh, students' of work, which has been reported in, in science uh, a, a little while back. This is combining observation from ground-based and then space-based. So these observations are from space-based NASA's uh, Solar Dynamic Observatory. These three layers represent dynamical changes in the lower chromosphere and in the photosphere and associated changes in the magnetic field. As I indicated, now it is quite clear that the changes in the magnetic field, also the bipolarity there, you know, their interaction that leads to sometimes magnetic cancellations and so on. And that can cancellation leads to certain form of, you know, dynamic uh, jets here. In this particular case, you see these, are, these are called spicules. They are, they are jet-like features, and they are also responsible for the heating of the outer atmosphere, namely the corona. Because I just mentioned that the corona is much hotter than the photosphere, which is the visible surface of the sun. It was not e easy to explain earlier that how is it that uh, you know corona is much hotter. So some of these you know magnetic uh, phenomena is responsible for heating in the outer atmosphere also even in the quiet region. So I just thought you know I will just show you certain you know examples uh, uh, how the observational thing combining ground based and the space based is moving. So in my last ten minutes I will try to rush a little bit and this is a uh, you know our uh, a projection of a national large telescope, uh, a two meter class to be built in this beautiful lake called Pangmong. You could see that we have certain uh, small little observa observational facilities brought down here. Why NLST, the National Large Solar Telescope is very important. The primarily the three big telescope, which is now available are going to be available. This is one is in the Hawaii. This is in, uh, in Big Bear Solar Observatory in US. This is in one of the Canary Islands. And there is a huge gap in the longitude, which uh, you know is required for solar observation, and NLST, the National Large Solar Telescope, which we are projecting to be built in the Himalayan side, uh, will really, really be very crucial. This is just a comparison of the table. I will probably rush a little bit, where it shows that you know NLST is probably is a world class uh, you know facility can be of a modest size as compared to all the international facilities, but will be adequate enough to fill that gap. The other major facility from the space platform is going to be from our own ISRO's mission called Aditya L1. This is a multi-institutional uh, you know, um, uh, uh, mission 
ISRO is, of course, uh, funding and supporting us for all the different payloads to be built in different institutions across. And there are seven payloads. There is a list of uh, you know, payloads here given. But uh, for the uh, sake of uh, you know, concern of time, I will not describe all the payloads in, in details. But what I wanted to just highlight, it has a coronagraph, which looks at the outer atmosphere of the sun, mimicking the total solar eclipse. Again, to uh, mention that there are three visible and one infrared channel. Solar ultraviolet telescope is being built in, in Ayuka in Pune, which is going to look at uh, the near UV wavelengths. Then we have uh, particle detectors, two particle detectors built in different uh, locations of, uh, of ISRO, namely Physical Research Laboratory and, and, and Trivandrum and so on. We have two X-ray uh, payloads, again built uh, one in ISRO and another one in, in Udaipur and, and, and combination of ISRO centers. And there is a magnetometer which measures the magnetic field of these particles which are coming from the sun. Because we are going to be in the interplanetary space location called Lagrangian one, which is in the sun earth distance. And then anything coming from the sun towards uh, the earth has to pass through this uh, you know, satellite. So we will have a combination of in situ instrument, which will detect the properties of these kind of you know, mass and particles which are coming from the sun. And also we'll look at remotely to the sun and try to see its outer atmosphere in the form of a coronagraphic images and the near UV images and so on. And to be noted here again, we have a multivalent aspect. This is X-ray, this is near UV, we have infrared and, and visible as well. So it's a suite of instrument, which is uh, shown here, how this uh, payload will be at different locations in the satellite and so on. So this is expected to be launched uh, next year and we are all very much excited. So what we are going to do is, here it is the edge of the sun, some disturbance come from the sun, as I indicated, uh, we will be primarily looking at this, uh, you know, layers of the sun, but why I am showing this movie is to highlight that it is still important to work with other agencies and international uh, bodies to completely track these, you know, ejecta, which is coming from the sun and to track all the way to, you know, near earth environment. So sun is and earth is actually almost like a couple system now if you really want to study earth uh, you know even environment uh, the magnetosphere effects and so on and so forth you have to understand what is happening in the sun in different time scales as well so uh, the corona as i indicated is highly variable here is an image from the corona from different uh, eclipses this is taken in 2016 2008 9 10 as I can see, and they are taken in two different filters. And as you can see from the two different colored images, they are always you know, superposing on each other as well. So the complexity of these structures, having different temperatures in the solar atmosphere or in the corona is also very well demonstrated here. And what is demonstrated here again is the solar cycle that during the minimum period, the sun shows a different kind of structure as compared to an active period when you have more uh, you know, activity and. Uh, so to understand all these, we need to understand the, uh, the physics of the magnetic field. And unfortunately, the physics of the magnetic field or direct observations are not easily available yet. So we need to have uh, uh, advancement in the, in the models. And this is something which is also happening in SESI. My colleague uh, Dipendu Nandi and his group has done uh, some of these uh, magnetic modeling. They predict actually how eclipse should look like before the eclipse day. This has been published and uh, they demonstrate that how good their models are. So we are going to use those models to you know, predict uh, or, or study the solar uh, changes as well. So uh, this is my last slide. Uh, basically, I wanted to uh, sort of demonstrate that the really, really we are going uh, into a huge, huge uh, uh, changes and there is a golden uh, opportunities in the next decade we need to actually look for these younger people. We had a you know, uh, solar physics again, a workshop which Professor Arnav Rajuri mentioned many years back in Kodaikinal. This time we had it in, in Leh, in Ladakh. And uh, to me, the, the future of the solar physics in India is actually at their hand. And hopefully we'll be able to you know, uh, guide them or motivate them towards uh, taking it to the next level. Yeah, thank you for your attention. So you have taken five minutes more than expected. Okay, so thank you, Dipankar, uh, for giving such an overview of uh, solar physics in India in a very limited time.
So I may mention that uh, apart from uh, the topics which Dipankar covered, there have been many other important uh, developments which uh, due to shortage of time he could not cover. So one very important uh, development I can mention is the uh, helioseismology, the study of oscillations of the sun, which uh, has given us quite a lot of information about the solar interior. And uh, Professor Antia, who is in the audience, he played uh, a very crucial role in making India is one of the major players in helioseismology. Anyway, maybe we can proceed with uh, a discussion of that in another talk. And now this uh, floor is open for discussion. So as uh, Dr. Uh, King King Mishra pointed out that uh, those who are attending it through, uh, uh, through this uh, Zoom platform, they can either uh, ask the question directly through Zoom or or put it in the chat and others also can put their questions in the chat. So any questions? So somebody who wants to ask the question orally can raise your hand or type it in the chat. Somebody who is in the Zoom. Yeah, before answering, I must again, uh, you know, uh, apologize or sort of compliment what you have said, that it is really, really uh, you know, sort of difficult to cover many aspects of also theoretical aspects, uh, particularly solar physics development. So I couldn't cover in that uh, 30 minutes. Uh, I'm sure in future occasion, we could uh, address some of those questions as well. Uh, sir, we have received a few questions uh, from our YouTube channel and uh, also, uh, some of the participants who registered at the time of registration also, they had uh, posed some certain qu queries. So uh, can I uh, read them out, sir? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, please uh, read them. So the question uh, which has uh, been received from Shushant Rajul, uh, his question is, what initiative can we all take together for creating awareness about space science and technology among students and teachers in India? especially at grassroots level. How can we create easy sources of information about space science and technology to reach out to children? Yeah, this is a very important aspect. Uh, some of us are unfortunately engaged in too many things, so we can't uh, distribute our uh, you know, time in appropriately. Uh, we have been actually discussing with the Astronomical Society of India on these regards as well. So how to have uh, more you know, training uh, schools and workshops. I must admit that you know these uh, even this picture what you see now here if, if these schools are dedicated for already you know uh, graduate students those who are already in the field but what is important is to take it to the ground uh, root level as uh, you know the uh, the person who have questioned so we are planning to have more uh, training level quest you know sort of workshops or or schools incidentally since the question has been asked. Uh, Aries has been given the responsibility of Aditya User Center. So that means, you know, uh, Aditya is India's own the space mission. How many, you know, users we can generate uh, from the younger side or from the university side is a very, very important aspect to be addressed. And I, I have uh, been given this uh, responsibility to conduct more regular sessions on basics on solar physics, how, what uh, Aditya is all about. And if Aditya data comes, who all can participate in, in, in those analysis and so on. So uh, please look at the ADIS uh, website and uh, we will announce very shortly about very periodical training programs. Yeah. So we'll, we'll come up with that, yeah. Oh, thank you, uh, Dr. Banerjee. I'll take the, another question, the second question. This is from the YouTube, uh, Mohammed Nadil. Why does the duration of solar flares tend to be much shorter than the duration of type two solar radio bursts? Okay, so these are slightly technical uh, details because I have not uh, told what is ty type two solar radio burst. So uh, essentially the solar flares are uh, now understood to be a process uh, explained by magnetic reconnection. So magnetic reconnection is uh, somewhat in this uh, movie uh, in a more general sense I was showing about magnetic annihilation. Like, you know, you have two opposite polarities. They, uh, they are forced to come together and then the, the magnetic energy gets converted into, you know, kinetic energy uh, and, and so on and, and heat. 
So this process uh, is very, very short. But whereas uh, the, uh, there are different type of radio bursts and uh, there are different phases of these you know, flares which, which we observe. So the, which phase of the solar flare is linked with the type two radio burst, that is what is uh, important to be understood. Yeah. So they are not uh, you know, representing the, uh, you know, the peak phase of the, of the flare activity. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. So the another question is from Kazi Abul Firoz. When there is a solar eruption, is there any technique or code to determine the possible amount of energy released from the eruption? Yeah, again, this is a very good question. Very nice. Uh, of course, there are uh, lots of uh, theoretical development or theoretical work happening in this. So what is important is, uh, as the question has been asked, can you sort of estimate how much energy will be released? That can be only uh, you know, understood if we know how much energy is in the first place there. Uh, so when these active regions are observed, they are composed of many uh, sunspots and their complexities are also important. I did not talk about the complexities in, within the sunspot. So one need to have a proper estimate about how much magnetic energy is uh, stored in this. And it not necessarily that the entire magnetic energy which is stored will be entirely released. So one needs to also observe the ejecta which is coming from their volumetric estimates and other observational inputs. One probably have to uh, you know, get a better estimate how much energy is being carried. But if one assumes that entire energy of this active region is converted, then of course that provides an upper limit of how much energy these uh, magnetic uh, you know, ejecta can carry. Uh, sir, the another question from Venu, uh, Veni Satya Narayana. Why can't we introduce the syllabi of space physics at undergraduate level? It may enhance interest over the subject and may lead to career in the astrophysics from hinterlands as well. Yeah, it's a good question. There is always a... Uh, sir, I think yeah, I also uh, can uh, yeah. see so, Dipankar, listen to Dipankar because yes. frozen, hopefully the connection will come back soon. Yeah, uh, we have two more questions on this uh, from this platform, sir. So I see a couple of questions in uh, posted in the chat for uh, for the Zoom. So anyway, let uh, let's okay. hope that uh, Dipankar will get gain connection soon. Yeah. You are muted, Dipankar, unmute. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what I was telling was that, uh, that the early uh, you know, introduction of space sciences uh, is debated. So when it is the most suitable for uh, space science uh, studies, once you have a reasonable knowledge about physics and mathematics is something which is under consideration. And there are, of course, attempt. There are, uh, you know, ISST uh, have a space science, uh, you know, program in in Trivandrum uh, because he so wanted to inculcate, uh, you know, uh, the space science uh, early and uh, for ISRO's own uh, particular applications and all that. They have introduced this institute called ISST. But in uh, in general graduation program or post graduation program, how much we should, uh, you know, incorporate uh, space sciences? This is something is still uh, you know, under consideration, but there are certain efforts and we think that we will be able to incorporate uh, uh, you know, some elective courses, if not pure space sciences uh, and masters. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, then uh, we'll take uh, two more questions, sir. Uh, this is from Shobhan Acharya. Can we launch citizen science projects so people can participate and also increase scientific temperance? It's more of you know promotion, popularization, and outreach. These questions are more directly towards that. Absolutely, absolutely. No, it's a very important <laughs> question. I am very much interested to do that. See, the citizen science program. This is very much supported by IAU uh, also. Uh, there are lots of data available now, and uh, the amount of data which is available, the professional astronomers may not be able to even ever uh, you know complete uh, studying them. So I think it's a good idea to. Uh, sort of, you know, uh, engage as many, uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, citizens to these exercises. 
we are taking certain initiatives from uh, ADs. Uh, I'm planning to at least take it through certain universities and so on and so forth. Another thing is, you know, some of the data, what we have, uh, that should be made to public. That's the first responsibility what we have. But again, you know, data has to be processed and data has to be made public in a, in a way or in a level where citizens can participate, uh, you know, actively. So I think this is a very important uh, program. Again, uh, as I mentioned, I have been connected with Astronomical Society of India as well. So uh, we are taking up uh, some of these, uh, you know, questions or suggestions very seriously. Hopefully in, in coming years, you will be, uh, you know, direct, uh, you know, uh, possibilities of that. I think there is a comment from uh, Professor Ananda Krishnan. Uh, can you see it, sir, on the- Yeah, I can just open the chat box. Yeah, yeah, in the chat box, yeah. Yeah, so Professor- Adding Ananda, to it, yes. <laughs> of course, of whether course. it is a solar flare or coronal mass ejection, both are manifestation of the magnetic field of the sun. Yeah, yeah. so this is, a, I think, a response to Yogesh. <laughs> he, he posed a question in the chat box. And thanks to Professor Ananda Krishnan, he already answered that. So uh, basically the question was by Ogesh, uh, is there a connection between solar flare and coronal mass ejection? Yes, there is a, a, almost a direct uh, uh, you know, connection. All solar flares almost leads to uh, you know, uh, coronal mass ejections, almost by default. But there are certain coronal mass ejections you may find because of some other instabilities, uh, which may have a smaller flare, but it may not be a sort of big flare. Like prominences, these are the objects in the in the in the again chromosphere of the sun with the huge uh, you know uh, magnetic cloud, and because of certain instabilities, often they get uh, you know uh, exploded and ejected, and they lead to coronal mass ejection. But then, why prominence do erupt? Uh, also, may flare may have a role into play. So, to be honest, you know there is a direct uh, relationship between the flare and the coronal mass ejection. And as Professor Amitakrishan actually responded in the chat box, they are both manifestations of the magnetic field of the sun only. Yeah. So I see that there is another question which you can respond quickly. So what is the current status of uh, Mission Aditya? Uh, so essentially, uh, all the payloads are in its final stage of uh, you know, integration in the uh, respective institution. And uh, uh, hopefully these payloads will be delivered to ISRO within the next few months. And once these payloads are delivered to uh, ISRO's uh, you know, integration uh, uh, satellite center, uh, there all the payloads will undergo a lot of uh, you know, tests. Uh, these are called satellite uh, fitness tests, you can say grossly. And, uh, and then the, it will be ready for flying. So sometime next year, we expect uh, to be in space. But of course, it will take a few months to reach the Lagrangian one point and so on. Yeah. Oh. Sir, uh, Professor Pradeep, Pradeep Chakravarti has raised his hands. He would like to ask a question directly to you. Uh, Dr. Chakravarti, you can answer. Yeah, he, he only posed this question in the chat box. Yeah, if he has okay. an additional question, he can yes, uh, yes, unmute okay. and, and, and yeah, ask. Yeah. I don't see him unmuting. So there is another chat you know, question in the chat box. Should I try to read and answer? Yes, 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 yes. sure, sir. Okay. So uh, Vidya Karak, he has asked this question. We are the future opportunity of students trained in solar physics. I mean the job opportunity. Oh, I see. So yeah, again, uh, these are difficult questions. But my take would be that we should not train any, uh, you know, any anybody in any branch of physics uh, to a very limited uh, way. Uh, my always, uh, you know, suggestion is that even I do solar physics, I should be a physicist first, then I should be an astrophysicist, then I should be a solar physicist. So that I have a opportunity or if I am asked to uh, go and teach somewhere, I should be able to do that. So I think the solar physics training, uh, fortunately, I think, uh, thanks to uh, Professor Arnav Rai Chudri or Professor Antia and Anant Krishnan, they have trained us to some extent to have this, you know, little bit of flexibility. And I think it's our responsibility to ensure that the solar physicists uh, or solar physics students are also trained in, in that way. But having said that, when you see such major facilities which are coming up in next decades, uh, whether it is RETL1 or NLST, uh, India never had any facility of that scale. 
I mean, even not even 20% of that scale. Uh, may, primarily, the solar physics was uh, focused mostly on the theoretical aspect and data from other space missions from NASA. I must be very open on this. Uh, some of us also got completely you know, matured only because of this open data policy of the NASA mission. So this is also another aspect I think uh, we have to keep in mind. All the future facilities should have provisions for you know, inclusiveness, trying to have as many people as users uh, to widen the scope. And then I think uh, there are many uh, such things. I did not talk about one element is the industry partnership, the, how much technology which is involved in these kind of missions, how much engineers are involved in this. I didn't get that opportunity, but since the question is asked, it is actually solar physics shows the way. When you want to build a telescope, it is important that you have lots of technological involvement from engineering side, from technical side, from computation. We are dealing with big data. So, you know, AI ML is the you know, key thing for us uh, for today to do, uh, you know, handle all this large volume of data. So I think there is lots of scope in that aspect as well. Uh, participating in this, uh, you know, uh, from the technical uh, qualified students, and subsequently, once they are involved in this kind of uh, programs, they can go to work in the industry as well because they are industry ready for this, uh, you know, industry demand. So I think that's that. I mean, I am quite hopeful about the future of job opportunities as well. So about this job opportunities, maybe I also can make a comment. So it was about thirty-five years ago when I was in US and I. Uh, plan to return to India from the US and I was uh, looking for jobs. At that time, there were barely four or five places in India where uh, I could apply for jobs and I knew that an application from an astrophysicist would be considered because at that time, most of the, there are these five IITs and, and most of the IITs and most of the universities had the impression that that, uh, that astrophysics, maybe not really physics. So most of the physics department would not look at the application from, from an astrophysicist. And we solar physicists had a, had a double difficulty when places which would be interested in astrophysics may think that, oh, maybe cosmology is the only astrophysics. So the scenario has changed tremendously during the 35 years. And I suppose one has to give a quite a lot of credit to Professor Narlika, who established Ayuka uh, to spread awareness of astrophysics within the Indian university sector. And now many of the IITs, including the older IITs, which did not have uh, astrophysics groups for many decades, now they have astrophysicists and new IITs and ISARs. They are also have astrophysics groups and, 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 and in many of the group there are solar physicists. So I would say that the job opportunity of uh, solar physics is now quite good. Of course, uh, not uh, well, you have to be uh, do very good work. A young person has to be very good work and has to be internationally competitive. If you just do mediocre work, you may not be able to get a job. But for, I think the young person who is now able to do internationally competitive research in solar physics, I think is, um, is, is able to get jobs in India. Okay, so I think we had enough discussion. So now uh, over to you, Dr. King Kini. Yeah, uh, is there any, uh, there's some comment on the chat box. Uh, yeah, should I just address that? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, so there is a question, how important do you think the Hisako Koama's observation regarding to the sunspot? In fact, uh, uh, very important. Basically, the point is that the sunspots uh, have been observed over more than a century from different parts of the globe. Uh, I today mentioned only about the Kodaikinal, but there is a Mount Wilson, which has uh, you know, uh, contributed enormously. There are quite a few observatories uh, from, from, uh, from Europe and again uh, from Japan. They have done these early observations. They're sometimes in the form of you know, drawings, not always in the uh, form of uh, you know, uh, direct imaging and so on. So, what is important is to collect all these informations from different observatories and then make a composite series. In fact, the one which I showed, uh, one of my students who has done this new sunspot area series, take the data taken from 13 different observatories. So we do now today cross calibration against you know, these kind of uh, time series observations from different places. And then we try to put all of them in the same place because if 
one particular place, if there is a problem that gets, you know, uh, uh, sort of corrected by combining data from a number of different uh, places. Also, the fact is historically, you know, I mean, there are certain days you will not have observation from one particular ground station. So typically you will have 250 to maximum 270 days of observation. So you will miss, you know, at least 70 days of observation. So that 70 days of observation can be taken from somewhere else. So that's how we do it. So since you mentioned, so uh, I don't recall actually all the details of these, uh, you know, particular observations you are referring to, but um, it is, uh, it is worthy to mention that uh, in Japan, there are quite a few uh, observatories where we are actually leaking data. And we have joined a program also from, uh, from uh, under this Indo-Japan program of DST, where we are actually currently looking at that data as well. Right. So <clears throat> no more questions for today. And in case there are any further questions, you know, you can share it uh, with us at the ISTI portal. And we will pass them on to Professor Dipakdar Banerjee as well as to Professor Arnav Roy Choudhury. And now those questions will be answered. Uh, so, uh, so, sir, we are very thankful to you for taking to this beautiful cosmic journey and making our audience understand why the study of sun, our nearest star is important. And uh, your lecture has provided us with a more scientific vision uh, to view sun just not as a life supporting star, and uh, the multi-wave lens that you have provided our audience with will ignite their curiosities and motivate them to take up solar physics or astrophysics as their core career uh, options. And uh, your lecture has provided a thorough information on the measurement of various dimensions of sun. I, on behalf of Vigyan Prasad and on my own behalf, thank Professor Arnav Roy Choudhury and Professor Dipankar Banerjee and express my sincere gratitude to you for joining us and uh, driving us through the journey of growth of solar physics uh, from ground to uh, space-based platforms. And I would also like to take this opportunity to place on record and hearty thanks to Professor Sachin Chaturvedi, <clears throat> Director General of RIS, Research and Information Systems for Developing Countries, and Dr. Amit Kumar from RIS for their enormous co cooperation, ideation in organizing this series of lectures, you know, which we are organizing every month. My special thanks to all the participants and attendees without whom this session holds no value. Finally, I extend my thanks to our director, Dr. Nakul Parashar for addressing the session as well as for supporting and motivating us throughout. And uh, I would like to also acknowledge the efforts put up by the entire team of ISTI portal for the per, uh, in a perfect logistic uh, support uh, from behind. Uh, for more information about the upcoming webinars and India's efforts in science and technology, I would request all of you to kindly visit India Science Technology and Innovation Portal. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you one and all for your kind presence. Wish you a very happy Deepavali. Uh, thank you. Warm welcome. Thanks a ton. Okay, thank you for this opportunity. Thank, thank you, you sir. Thank you for being with us.